Just going to give it 10 seconds for people to sign up. Well, hello everyone, uh, or a good morning, depending when uh, where you are right now. My name is uh, Mihai Gihaya. I'm a policy analyst for the um, European Policy Center in, in Brussels. It's my pleasure to welcome you at this uh, policy dialogue on Iran, uh, the future of nuclear deal, regional security issues, and economic uh, aspects. Well, I'll just make a brief introduction and then we'll just uh, start our panel uh, discussion. Well, we are now about um, three months since uh, President Raisi took over in, uh, in Iran. So I think it's a good moment to look what, has, what have been the shifts in its policy, what has been achieved so far, how his administration looks at uh, foreign policy, what are the main directions, what are the changes from the previous administration, how he approaches the current internal issues, the economic hardships, the COVID-19 pandemic, and so on and so forth. At the same time, it's also important to look at the regional aspects, how shifts are changing at the regional level, what are the main, um, main new things appearing, what are the trends that are shaping the future interactions. At the same time, we have seen that the crisis in, uh, in Afghanistan has important aspects. We've seen, uh, we see new challenges such as migration, terrorism, border issues, and of course also political issues related to interaction with the Taliban reg regime. At the same time, it's also important to zoom out a little bit and look also at the US and the EU reaction to these changes in the region, how they approach the, the nuclear negotiations and what is their future policy regarding, regarding Iran and of course also regarding the, the region. Well, there are many, many questions that, uh, that appear here, and uh, fortunately, I don't have to address them. That's why we have a stellar panel today with us, and I'm just going to briefly introduce the, the panelists. First, the, I'll start with Dr. Shireen Hunter, who's an honorary fellow at Georgetown University. She has an experience spanning over four decades in, uh, in academia, in think tanks. She has uh, written multitude books. She has taught at many universities, and she brings an incredible experience altogether. Secondly, we have uh, Dr. Azad Ezamirirad, who is um, Deputy Head of Africa and Middle East Division at the SWP in Berlin. She also has an experience in teaching, advising the German government, other governments. She's also a researcher on Iran, and she brings also a wealth of experience to the discussion. Thirdly, we have uh, Mohammad Shabani, who is the editor of Amwaj Media. He's also a doctoral researcher at SOAS in London, and he's an expert on, on regional security aspects and also on domestic Iranian political issues. And last but not least, we have Eldar Mamedov, who's a foreign policy advisor, for the Social Democrat group in the European Parliament. He has been involved for more than a decade in European policymaking and advising European uh, policymakers. Maybe just before we start a couple of uh, logistical aspects, each speaker will give uh, some brief remarks at the beginning. I'll, I'll have a few follow-up questions and then we'll open the, the floor for questions from the audience. If you'd like to, to ask a question, then you have at the bottom of your screen the Q&A button. You can type your question there. Whereas a second option, you can hit uh, raise your hand button and uh, I can give you the floor. My colleagues will unmute you and then you can ask uh, your question directly. And without further ado, I will start with you, Shireen, and the floor is yours. And thank you very much for joining us, all of you. Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon uh, to our co-panelists and as well as those who will be joining and asking questions. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and meet some new colleagues and uh, connect with some old friends. Uh, if you do have permission, uh, I would like to make, instead of going into details of uh, what is you know, Mr. Raisi thinking about JCPOA and what is Mr. Abdullahian and so on and so forth. Um, I would like to make some basic fundamental comments about the dilemmas uh, policymaking, foreign policymaking in the uh, uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, in fact, I, am, I have to confess that I 
you know, started life at a young age as a member of the Iranian diplomatic service, as the first woman who entered the diplomatic service. So my acquaintance with Iranian foreign policy, uh, Iranian conditions is, is almost goes, is almost now becoming close to 60 years. So I have a, also an ability to compare uh, with the pre and post revolution and the priorities and, and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, I have been following it for more than 40 years and writing about it. So um, you will allow me if just uh, make a couple of uh, fundamental remarks. Of course, it, it's open to, uh, um, to uh, talent. Um, one thing I have to say, first of all, is that it's becoming increasingly, at least for this analyst, um, difficult to make sense of the foreign policy of the Islamic Republic. Um, because, uh, you know, it's just really, when you look at what these people have been doing and the consequences of their policy for the country, uh, it doesn't make sense. No, it does simply does not compute. So I have been looking is that why is this has happened? Uh, one thing is that, as you see, I didn't use the foreign policy of Iran. I said the foreign policy of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And I make this um, distinction advisedly. The fact of the matter is, since the 1979 revolution, starting with Khomeini, those who have run in, in fact, in effect, not just people who come and go and are used, the Islamic Republic of Iran don't give, excuse my language, don't give a hoot for Iran. In fact, don't. For them, in fact, they are anti-Iran. The concept of Iran uh, is, is something that even some of them themselves are saying. For them, Iran serves as a headquarters. I said this in front of uh, Dr. Zarif at some point some years ago. And they use Iran as a kind of a headquarters, headquarters for uh, advancing the revolutionary objectives, and uh, the advancing of this vaguely defined Islamic uh, 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 objectives, and of course, the revolution. Because otherwise, any country who cared about Iran, its survival, its territorial integrity, it will not continue this policy. You look, Iran is now surrounded. Iran is surrounded in the east, Taliban, the Iranians are going and begging Taliban come and trade with us and do this and so on. I mean, they have no sense that they, this is never gonna happen. In fact, the Taliban spokesman said if Iran wants a uh, old comprehensive government in Kabul, why doesn't they have, why don't they have a old comprehensive government in Tehran? And frankly, I can't blame them saying that. On the other side, you have Turkey incredibly predatory towards Iran. Turkey has objectives of dismembering Iran. That has been Erdogan's dream for a long time. On the east, on the south, you have the Arab states and now Israel is Iran's neighbor. If it comes to military um, confrontation, Bahrain, Azerbaijan, they, Israel can fly from them. So any, kind, any government that cares about Iran or men, uh, survival of Iran cannot continue the, power, the uh, uh, present thing. In this context, I think that I am seeing a very ominous trend again reappearing. And that is again attacking um, three Islamic Iran. This is an old chestnut, now they have gotten it. Raisi goes to Persepolis and says that uh, Persepolis is the sign of the, uh, uh, what is it, um, injustice, and it shows what happens to dictators and so on. And uh, Zarqami, the new minister of culture, says that we have to have agriculture around the Pasargad uh, complex. And now even some people dare to challenge this. I couldn't believe it that an article published in um, a website that uh, Sadeh Kharazi runs, 
and said that you know we shouldn't really undermine our own national identity, particularly when we have countries like Turkey and Azerbaijan challenging it. But this is the mindset of these people. And um, so I think that you have to really understand this in that sense. The other thing is that Islamic Republic, although sometimes in their foreign policy in the past, they have in certain areas gone a more pragmatic direction, um, their, their uh, uh, survival, unfortunately, as an ideological state is um, caught up with a certain perspective. And, and Khamenei really uh, personified this. Khamenei never beams as much as he meets with Assad. I mean, he really, you see pleasure in his face. And so I, I can't understand that. I have never seen him react like that to uh, any of his country men or, or women. So I think that for them, this is a very big thing. And in this context, of course, it becomes also anti-Westernism. And anti-Westernism, why? It's not just the anti-imperialist struggle. Why is they don't struggle against the Russian or Chinese imperialism? They are much more predatory and Iran has suffered far more from them, uh, excluding the British, but you know, other European powers or US hasn't done as much. I mean, that's a fact. So I think that this is also you have to understand for them, West is also the, 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 the uh, symbol of modernism. And modernism is poison for the clerical uh, establishment, particularly the radical establishment. It's just, if you follow it, if you just read what they are saying, I think part of research is really mostly is reading. Talking to people fine, but reading is very important because there you have what they think in black and white. However, I would add here briefly, I think I have a couple of more minutes, uh, that not all of the people in the Islamic Republic, including in the, within the clerical thing, uh, agreed with this. They were some, yes, they wanted to be in power and Islamic uh, uh, discourse was useful for them, but there were some that they had also some feeling for the country. I would say that people like Rafsanjani, Khatami, and Rouhani, particularly Khatami, Khatami really did have a feeling for Iran, and 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 you know, and so you know those people. So we see that sometimes they shift. The other thing, however, you have to understand is that um, Iranian politics and attitudes towards Iran became fundamentally different after the collapse of the Soviet Union. After the collapse, I, I don't think that we have still quite understood, even in Europe, a lot of Europe's travails comes from that, that the systemic impact of the collapse of the USSR, the old things did, it doesn't just hold. And one of those things is that Iran as a buffer state lost its importance. U.S. did not have to worry about Russians coming in. Israel didn't have to worry uh, uh, Russians coming in. What happened was that Iran's potential as a middle power country became more important and preventing the actualization of this potential became more important. And so I would say that already by 87, I would really date it to the meeting of um, George Bush, the father, and Gorbachev, and somewhere in Mediterranean, if I'm not wrong. After the beginning of the containment policy was there. And I think people think that Clinton started dual containment, but James Baker in, you know, said that, including in Central Asia and other uh, places since then, the United States and by extension Europe uh, have really not been willing to deal with Iran. It became, Iran became useful for a lot of the purposes, certainly for Israel. I mean, without the Iranian threat, you couldn't have had the, the Arab, <laughs> in fact, the Israeli Arab option began in 1987. That instead of looking at the periphery, although they still look at the periphery somehow, we have to really make alliance with Arabs. <clears throat> 
So this is another thing that Iran doesn't want to uh, quite understand. And exaggeration of Iran's influence. Iran doesn't have any influence. That's a fact. I think in some ways, Iran has become prisoner of its so-called proxies. They think that if there is an attack on Iran, Hezbollah is gonna attack Israel. I'm sorry, this is again a pipe dream that they don't seem to understand. Look at what's happening in Iraq. So this is some of the things that I'm saying. Lastly, about JCPOA. JCPOA never was about Iran nuclear problem. I will tell you, if Iran's threat of Iran acquiring a bomb was really imminent, JC, Trump would not have exited JCPOA. The reason they have been able to do this for this long is because Iran cannot have a nuclear weapon. The thing is, for example, Pakistan, I think China gave Pakistan seven things, and at some point, Canada. Same thing with India. Nobody is willing to give Iran, and they're no, never going to be. I remember exactly since 1993, the Israelis have been saying regularly that Iran is about a year, six months away for a bomb. So I think that what we have to realize is that JCPOA is the uh, reflection of the fundamental uh, problems of Iran uh, and Iran's uh, polity uh, with the outside world. And um, I think that uh, Iran has lost opportunities and of course, Americans haven't really responded. I will have to say they should have responded to Rafsanjani's efforts, you know, but America were always wanted all or nothing. You do either everything we want right now, no, knowing that they can't because of the politics, or you know, it's my way or highway. And of course, I can't go into because I'm already gone after that. So, so what does that mean? What that means, I think we are going to see a lot more talk. Uh, um, but I don't think that they are going to do anything major unless, unless the economic economic situation becomes so desperate that they will settle for a for a limited respite. That's what they want. They from today, let's get over this. Then we'll see what, what they ha don't have no long term vision for the country or what we want. Any realistic long term vision with Iran centered outlook? No, with Palestine, Syria, Iraq, but not Iran. Um, and in terms of foreign policy, they don't have any more option left. They say we want to go to the East. Well, the East doesn't particularly want you. I mean, the fa it is a failure. India didn't come to Jabahar. China hasn't had any investment in Iran. And Russia is playing them like a fiddle. Russia is preventing Iran from uh, exploiting its uh, oil uh, reserves in the Caspian. And Russia has incredible influence within the IRGC. I mean, they are, a lot of them are the sort of leftist turned Islamists. And they want to have relations with neighbors. Neighbors don't want relations with you. I mean, you just look around. Uh, so what is gonna happen? I am unfortunately very pessimistic about Iran's future. And I think that to countries like Israel and Arabs uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and so on, they have hardened their position. Uh, what really, Iran needs a very bold action, and I'm not sure even that would be uh, sufficient. And my last word is, and I think the Iranians should get this message, without reaching some kind of modus vivendi with Israel, whether it is fair or unfair, Iran cannot expect normal relations internationally. Look at what Russia is doing, Putin and uh, Bennett and, and, and so on. So as long as the Iranians don't get this understood, I, and I don't want to use the word Iranians because uh, I would say at least 75, 80% of Iranians want it out. You just see the way they are leaving. According to their own sources last year, 3000 doctors left Iran. So, I mean, uh, um, figures uh, speak to themselves. Now, my last word, I'm sorry, I have gone on too far. I really apologize. My last word is this. Europe cannot just sit on the sidelines, I think, uh, because 
the way the trend is going, I think, um, conflict becomes inevitable. Absolutely inevitable at some point by accident or design. And I think that the uh, Europe will be much more on the front lines. So this is my reading. Uh, I am looking forward to the comments of others. Uh, I hope I am wrong. I hope I am too pessimistic. I really would like uh, to be corrected. And uh, well, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shireen, for this ample overview where you touched uh, many, many subjects. I would uh, just maybe quickly move to, to Azadev and to, to pick up from the issue of the GCPOA. Azadev, maybe you can give us a, a brief uh, you know, state of play of the negotiations and your take on what, uh, what might happen next. Yes, thank you very much, Mihai. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I will also just very briefly and very broadly make some comments on, on the current situation regarding the nuclear crisis. And I, I fully agree with, with uh, Dr. Shirin Hunter in the sense that um, obviously we have now entered a critical stage with regard to the nuclear crisis and the current stage is simply not sustainable. So we will either find a path back to some sort of nuclear compromise, whether it's the JCPA or some sort of variation of it, or we risk severe escalation. Um, and that is across the board, whether it's on the regional front, on the proliferation front, or the military front. Um, and I think, unfortunately, um, with regard to the Biden administration, we have already lost a lot of valuable time. And I think a problem here was that um, they were too much focused on the Iranian presidential elections as the decisive um, date. And I think this led to underestimating the overall nuclear political climate in Iran that goes way beyond the executive here. Um, so there should have been a sense of urgency way before the new government came in in Tehran. Unfortunately, there wasn't the sense of urgency within the Biden administration to take some major necessary steps. So this is part of, I think, the problem that we're facing now that we have already lost valuable time. Um, I think part, again, of this problem is being very much focused on one actor or maybe two and not looking that much on the whole mechanism and system that is in place in Iran, particularly when it comes to nuclear decision making. Obviously, we have the supreme leader who is the ultimate decision maker, but we also have the Supreme National Security Council. And next to decision making, you also have decision shaping um, actors that do play a role here, whether it's the parliament, whether it's opinion makers um, in Iranian media, whether it's prominent clerics or parts of the um, military and security establishment, all those form a nuclear political environment that does shape nuclear decision making in Iran. And we've seen that in the past. The Supreme Leader over these past 15 years um, and more has actually changed his position with regard to the nuclear front several times. And he has been sensitive um, with regard to the overall political climate. In other words, nuclear discourse in Iran actually matters. Um, the, the Supreme Leader does not operate in a vacuum here. Other actors are important that go beyond just the government. Now, this means that there is a set of constraints domestically for both the Supreme Leader and the new government, which already has made things a little bit more complicated. And this is very much related to the disastrous, if you will, experience of the nuclear agreement um, in Iran's foreign policy. Um, obviously, the outcome was not what many of the pro-engagement camp in Iran were hoping for. This is essentially a failed foreign policy experiment from, from Tehran's point of view. They did engage, they did stick to their commitments, yet this was still not enough for the Trump administration to, to stay in. So this is obviously disastrous for anyone within the foreign policy community in Iran who was in favor of engagement here. They've lost significant ground. This also means that there are very specific expectations and demands with regard to the Supreme Leader and the government when it comes to new nuclear talks nowadays. Um, so basically what the Supreme Leader and the Raisi government have to avoid is they cannot be fooled twice. I mean, they simply cannot afford being fooled twice. And there is this fear of some sort of entrapment, if you will, with regard to the Vienna talks. How can we be sure? How can we have the right um, elements in place to ensure that we do not 
get into the same kind of situation that we were after the first time we entered this kind of nuclear compromise. And this is significant. And again, this goes way beyond the government here. This is the entire kind of establishment, political establishment in Tehran right now, who have a specific set of expectations and broader demands than what we might want Tehran to have at this point. So this goes back to the kind of clear demands that we hear from Tehran when it comes to verification, when it comes to assurances. These type of things are particularly important, again, not just because there's a new government in Tehran, but because the whole nuclear discourse in Iran has fundamentally shifted, uh, mainly due to the experience of the JCPOA. Now, what does this all mean? Does this mean that there's no hope when it comes to finding a political solution? And here I try to maybe offer a somewhat more optimistic um, view. So I think that there are some drivers here that would incentivize the current government and the Supreme Leader to be willing to make some major concessions once again, and to be looking for a, some sort of political understanding, again, whether it be the JCPA or something else. And the main driver here, I think, is basically transition. Iran is in a very critical stage of transition right now. The question of succession is looming on the horizon. Um, managing succession is way up on the agenda of the Supreme Leader. So he wants to make sure that there is an orderly transition in Iran um, once he's not able to, to um, uphold this position any longer due to health issues or, or death to make sure that there is not a face of severe instability for the political system. And there's this particular interest for Raisi um, uh, specifically when it comes to that as well, since he seems to have ambitions to become the next Supreme Leader himself. So being in this critical transition stage does pose a lot of challenges here. Just suppose the JCPA were to fall apart completely and Iran would get into a huge, huge you know, new stage of, of crisis mode. Just the number of crises and challenges that Iran would have to deal with is, is overwhelming. I mean, add to the US sanctions, we impose UN sanctions, we impose EU sanctions, you would have resolutions in the Board of Governors, in the IAEA, you would have resolutions um, within the Security Council. Iran would be largely um, isolated internationally, could not even, you know, um, um, rely on Russian or Chinese support under these kind of circumstances. There would be a lot of added economic pressure on the domestic situation that is already pretty tense to begin with. Um, if you look at unemployment, inflation, if you look at the environmental issues, water shortages, blackouts, dissatisfaction within um, the population, um, in general, you know, risk of mass protests, add to that regional instability, further cyber attacks, acts of sabotage. We just recently again heard about the tanker incident here, um, other acts of assassination. So all the things that we are already seeing, but on a much larger level. So you would enter basically kind of crisis overload mode um, almost that you would normally want to avoid to begin with, but especially want to avoid when you are in a critical stage of transition. Now, does that mean that this would incentivize or push Tehran to come to negotiation cable and make major concessions? Of course not. Um, first of all, there are other factors that weigh in. And secondly, as I said, since there's still the sense of possible entrapment, a lot will rely on how credible the Vienna path is actually going to be um, in Tehran's perception. Is this really a credible path to form some sort of um, feasible alternative for Tehran to go down. And here, I think we cannot underestimate, um, or should not underestimate the role of narratives, of gestures, of rhetorics here. We saw just recently the E3 plus one statement, where I think was a very positive step again to hear from the Biden administration um, that their willingness to come back into full compliance and to actually stay in full compliance so long as Iran does the same. And this is not the first time that Washington has made their pledge. Actually, we've, we've heard it several times. Also, the Europeans conveyed that message to Tehran. But to offer it in this kind of setting within the E3 plus one format at this critical time is much more impactful than previous kind of rounds of pledges that were made. And this is the kind of language that would have to find its way into a document in Vienna as well in the end for something that um, also can be sold in Tehran and can be worked with domestically. Another area, and I'm going to finish um, very shortly here, I think where the Europeans can add another, let's say, um, area or another safety net would be much more investment, serious investment in instex to make it some sort of additional layer of, of um, confirmation, additional layer that can 
work um, in case of sanctions reimposition, even despite the kind of pledges that we hear nowadays. Because obviously this government is um, eager and is willing to find a solution that can at least even bring them, carry them throughout the next upcoming three years. So this is kind of my positive look on what could incentivize Tehran to move forward here. Um, this is only, you know, the, pro the projection of, of Tehran. Obviously, there's so much more to take into consideration on the US side. But I still firmly believe that when we come back to Vienna and Iran obviously has to make that important step to really come back to the negotiation table, that's a prerequisite. Um, and if there are credible ways to provide some sort of assurances, if Iran is able to overcome their own sense of par paranoia and their own sense of overestimating their own position, thinking maybe they can navigate through this crisis mode, then there is a basis where we can at least hope for averting a more major severe crisis that actually nobody really wants to end up with. And I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Azadeh, for giving us this uh, more optimistic perspective and also the state of play of the GCPOA and all the views from different actors. I'll maybe now move to you, Mohammed, for a more domestic and regional perspective of, <laughs> of different issues. Yes, thank you so much for organizing again this timely event. And I uh, thank my colleagues and, and the audience as well for joining today. I don't want to repeat much of the excellent points that have been brought up. So I'll try to go into a bit more detail about the nitty gritty of the what's been happening basically since Raisi took office and also look at some of the reactions to what's been happening in Afghanistan uh, in the past couple of weeks. So the number one thing since uh, Raisi took office in uh, early August has been that he has taken his time to build his foreign policy and national security. Before that, the assumption, if you recall, around April, May, among some voices was that there's no point in speaking with Rouhani and his team, which were the authors of the JCPOA, and instead kind of uh, hold on until you have a quote unquote unitary state, in which case you deal with one entity and that entity makes decisions and simple as that. And you should be much more straightforward. Turns out that's not the case. At the time, I was arguing that whenever the conservatives have monopolized power in Iran, we've only seen it descend into infighting sooner rather than later. And I think what we've seen since Raisi has taken office and the delay in forming internal consensus on the different positions is that there are real gaps. Uh, and I can point out to a specific example here. Um, one of the hardliners, Saeed Jalili, for instance, did not get the position within the Supreme National Security Council he wanted. He did not get his deputy, Ali Bagheri Kani, as foreign minister. Instead, Amir Abdullahian, who's uh, very different from his team, although by no means a liberal, not even remotely, but very different from these people. He became chief diplomat. And after a lot of politicking, managed to, they managed to impose uh, Bagheri Kani as deputy foreign minister and also chief uh, nuclear negotiator. So there are a lot of conservative uh, inside politics going on. And it's about dividing up the spoils, so to speak, and also fighting about how to approach the resumption of the talks. And I think this is really important to keep in mind. You're not dealing with one entity now. The difference is that they're all conservative. doesn't mean that they're all united. So this is a really crucial point to keep in mind. Another thing to look at is the pattern of appointments. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, IRGC commanders being appointed to keep um, offices. Uh, we've seen multiple uh, governors being IRGC commanders. We've seen the interior ministry, um, Ahmed Vahidi, a former Quds Force commander, being appointed as interior minister. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think previously he served under Ahmadinejad as well. So we look at what are their positions. So one of the big issues to look at in direct connection with the JCPOA is, for instance, Iran's um, measures to comply with international anti-money laundering standards and countering the financing of terrorism. Rouhani was not able to push through these kinds of things. And now we see figures like Vahidi vehemently opposing them. Now, whether JCPOA is signed or not, unless Iran complies with these standards, it will continue to be blacklisted by the FATF, right? And the only other country that's currently blacklisted by the FATF is, is North Korea. So even Chinese banks will not deal with Iran as long as you deal with these kinds of issues, because these are extraneous to JCPOA. These are highly technical issues to, to really keep in mind beyond the broad strokes. And the third element to look at when you consider Iran's uh, delay in resuming the talks. You know, the last 
round of negotiations, unless I'm wrong, was June 20th. So it's two days after Raisi's election. And nothing has happened since. And I think another element to consider beyond the actual efforts, the real, I think there's genuine efforts of, of forming a, a united position uh, and also domestic opposition. Uh, I think it's the reality is that Biden took his time to get to the negotiating table. And you're dealing with people who want to send the message that we want equal standing. We are equals at the table. So if you took your time, we're also going to take your time. You can wait for us. And there's an additional kind of element there. And that is the fact that they want to signal that they don't need the JCPOA. They'll be fine just without it. Now, whether that's reality or not, that's an entirely different question. No, no, that's not what I'm debating. I'm talking about the signal. So as for the impact of all of this on the negotiations, I mean, again, going back to Bagheri Kani, this is a person who failed while being a deputy negotiator previously under Jalili to reach any kind of deal with the US, right? And since the JCPA was signed, and in fact, during the negotiations leading up to its signing in 2015, has been a vehement critic of it. So you right now, the chief Iranian negotiator is a vehement, explicit, diehard JCPOA critic who thinks it's among the worst things that's happened in Iran's history, right? This is the reality. At the same time, even someone like him has to operate within the confines of the political system. And this is what Azadeh was talking about, that there are bigger systemic positions. And I think the bigger systemic position right now is that they understand that mutual compliance with JCPOA is to Iran's benefit. Now, given the experience that they've had, you know, fool me once, fool me twice, they need some kind of reassurances, right? To make sure that the next US president doesn't withdraw. Just two days ago, we had Ted Cruz, a Republican US senator, saying flat out, this is quote, it's an actual quote on Twitter, 100%, these are his words, not mine, 100% the next Republican president will withdraw from the deal. So what do you do under these kinds of conditions, right? So they, they are looking for guarantees and uh, it's highly doubtful whether they'll get them and what will ultimately come out of the dialogue. My personal kind of sense is that what Shirin was uh, alluding to, I think there'll be a respite that they may be looking for. The respite I think could be in the form of a, an interim deal. And that interim deal probably will look like a upgraded version of the JPOA, the Joint Plan of Action, not the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. That was an interim deal reached in Switzerland in Geneva, I think it was in November 2013. And what that entails is that Iran ceases enrichment at higher levels and in exchange gets uh, some concessions, such as the unblocking of a, a portion of its uh, frozen assets abroad. That's something to look at, I think, logically. Uh, moving on to Afghanistan, I think um, the reactions to the withdrawal are very instructive and also tells a lot, not just about Iranian politics and its stances in general, but also, I think, perceptions of Iran. The US withdrawal was welcome. Iran had no other option but to welcome it because it's always been principally opposed to the US presence in the region. Having said that, under Rouhani, it was quite explicit uh, in basically portraying the withdrawal as what they called irresponsible. The foreign ministers that called it irresponsible. And the reason why they call it irresponsible is because the Taliban, as much as they're portrayed as some kind of partners of Iran, are no partners of Iran. No one in Iran sees the Taliban as a friend. At best, they are perhaps seen as frenemies, elements of the Taliban, not Taliban as a movement. The Taliban is a hardline Sunni movement, many of whom among the movements see Shiites as heretics, right? And they have a history of persecuting Hazara ethnic Shia Af Afghans. You have a situation where in the late 90s, Iranian consulate in Mazar Sharif was overrun. Diplomats were killed. Journalists were killed. Iran, under Khatam, he almost went to war with Afghanistan under the Taliban regime, right? The previous time they were. So I think this is a big thing to consider. Another thing to look at is the fact that the collapsed Afghan government was a partner of Iran. It came into existence directly because of Iran's input in the Bonn conference, late 2001. And again, Zarif had played a key role in those negotiations in making sure that you had a unity government established in the aftermath of the US-led invasion. So now Iran has lost that partner. And you have to really look at that uh, in the broadest stroke of things. 
Right now, Iran's main concern is the lack of inclusivity in the Afghan government and what this may mean for Afghan policy towards Iran in the future. There are a series of challenges to look at. It's not just about security challenges, it's also about trade. Uh, Iran, Afghanistan is among Iran's biggest non-oil export markets. It acts as a key source of foreign exchange. How are all of those practical things going to be impacted now? You have your environmental issues, which also ties into security. For instance, the Helmand River flows into Iran. How is that going to look in the future? This can cause major security issues in southeastern Iran. So these are very pragmatic issues that Iran has to deal with any ruler of Afghanistan. Doesn't matter their ideological stripe. Another interesting thing to me about Iran's policy towards Afghanistan is that historically, the main military allies of Iran have been Tajiks. Now, Tajiks are Sunnis, but they're Persian speakers. So culturally, they're quite close to Iran. At the same time, the, Iran has also had very close ties to Hazaras, as I mentioned previously. These are ethnic Shiites, right? The main ally of Iran, military ally of Iran in Afghanistan historically has been the Tajiks. That has changed over the past decade with the emergence of the civil war in Syria. What we have seen uh, is the recruitment of mainly Hazara Shiites who are resident in Iran and their deployment in Syria under the Fatimi division organized by the Quds Force. Now they're a very capable military force. The Tajiks on the, on the other hand, and this is really interesting because we've seen this also in mainstream media, having been hunted down by the Taliban now in the aftermath of the collapse of the Afghan government, what we're seeing now is that many of the ranks of ISIS, many of the recruits are actually Tajiks, right? So these are people who have no choice but to join ISIS because right now they're being hunted down by the Taliban. This doesn't make any sense, I think, to most people. Why would somebody who worked with the security services under the collapsed Afghan government now join ISIS? But the explanation is my enemy's enemy is my friend, right? So how does, how does Iran deal with this? It's a, Afghanistan is a big state of disarray. The lack of inclusivity in Iran's view, I think, portends assured instability in the long run. You have a major security challenge. Some of Iran's own military allies in the past are now joining its enemy. Meanwhile, its main asset, the Hazaras, the Fatah Immune, cannot be deployed right now because if you do deploy them in there, you will have a civil war next door. And Iran will lose that civil war likely because there are simply not enough Shiites in Afghanistan, right? And in addition to all of this, we're seeing a continued kind of clash over the framework for engagement on, on Afghanistan. We had two uh, sessions so far of a conference that gathers Afghanistan's six neighbors. It was initi initiated in a virtual format in Islamabad a couple of weeks ago. The second iteration was held in Tehran recently. And in the most recent iteration, Iran made sure that Russia was invited. Prior to the recent Afghanistan conference in Tehran, there was another session separate from this in Moscow, but Iran was not happy with. All the while, the old six plus two format, which is Iran's uh, Afghanistan's six neighbors, plus Russia and the United States is non-existent. And Iran will not join any such dialogue unless it's within a UN umbrella and the UN is nowhere to be seen. So there is no framework to discuss what's gonna happen in Afghanistan. The domestic situation is very problematic and Iran is seeing threat threats down the horizon. So uh, I think I'll stop there and I probably open up some questions later. I hope this was useful. Thank you very much. Um, uh, this has been very useful to, to understand uh, the Afghanistan crisis and the impact on, on Iran. You made uh, quite a few very, very interesting points that I'm sure many of us would like to follow up on. But maybe now I'll just move to, to Eldar to see also the perspective from the EU. How has the EU positioned itself vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the new Iranian administration? Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to join you uh, with a caveat that I'm speaking on my own behalf, not necessarily in the name of European Parliament or my socialist group. So a uh, quick point from the outset, uh, the European Union in current juncture is basically playing an auxiliary role. Uh, it's essentially reduced to uh, trying to synchronize the political momentums in Washington, in Tehran, in hopes uh, of bringing those two uh, to talks. Um, and uh, admittedly, uh, the luck has not accompanied the EU in this effort. We had hardline administration in the US uh, coinciding with moderate administration in Tehran. Now um, the roles have changed. We have uh, 
moderate administration in Washington and a hardline administration in, in Tehran. And uh, it's proving to be exceedingly difficult to find some ground where the two main protagonists uh, of this JCPOA story could uh, um, find some common ground. Now, the question is, uh, was it inevitable that the EU would be reduced to that role? Uh, could not the EU be a real agent uh, in this whole JCPOA saga? And that question cuts straight to the issue of the EU strategic autonomy or the lack thereof. So uh, lately, this uh, topic has become very fashionable in Brussels uh, uh, after the shambolic withdrawal uh, of the United States from Afghanistan. After the AUKUS deal, uh, we have adopted the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. We are constantly talking in this town about increasing EU military capabilities. And of course, these are very sexy and fashionable topics, uh, but those are for the future. Um, why not start where, uh, why not start uh, applying, implementing strategic autonomy where the EU already has power to do so? And that's an economic sphere. And let's not forget that in terms of uh, world share of GDP, we are economic peers to the United States. And uh, <clears throat> the big failure, in my opinion, is that when the Trump administration uh, withdrew and violated the JCPOA, the EU has proved to be, uh, or rather E3 uh, has proved to be incapable of uh, delivering at least some of the economic benefits uh, that Iran was uh, entitled to as part of the JCPOA and as a site that actually was fulfilling with its obligations uh, uh, for full 18 months after uh, Trump administration withdrew from the agreement. So, uh, we had blocking regulations, which were formally introduced, but apparently they did not work. So why do we need blocking regulations that do not work? Uh, we had instex that uh, essentially never took off the ground. We had uh, a lot of statements uh, of political support uh, for the JCPOA, uh, which were all very welcome. But uh, to simply say that uh, the EU governments were fully powerless to encourage the private business uh, to conduct legitimate uh, business in Iran strikes me as uh, somewhat underwhelming and unconvincing. I will not go into details on, on that front, but uh, the reality is that we are now back uh, to the question of EU strategic autonomy. Uh, this question has become more acute because uh, it seems that everybody is now realizing that the Trump administration, Trump's four years, were not an aberration. With Biden, we see essentially America first in a more polite version, of course. Uh, of course, uh, it could be argued that uh, we share more values in common uh, with the Biden administration but than with the Trump, but values do not always translate in the common interest. So, and here uh, I want to emphasize that uh, uh, Whatever happens with the JCPOA, Iran will keep being a pivotal country in the region, which is of uh, capital importance for the EU and for its security. So uh, we still need to have uh, those channels of communication with Tehran. Obviously, the best would be if the JCPOA could be revived. And uh, it is indeed encouraging that uh, in the um, latest statement delivered by US and three European countries, uh, there was a clear commitment uh, from the US side uh, to uh, rejoin and to live uh, by the commitments provided that Iran does the same. So that's very encouraging. Uh, but I would uh, again insist that as Europeans, we cannot uh, simply see uh, relations with Iran as a nuclear problem. And here uh, I want to tie up with uh, uh, situation in Afghanistan, the refugees, instability. So where are those refugees uh, going to go uh, if the solution is not found to Europe? So um, I think uh, that provides a very clear venue where the uh, European Union uh, has to maintain uh, this channel of dialogue with Iran and amplify it also to 
other regional hotspots. Because as was said earlier, uh, European Union, Europe is at the uh, front, at the front line of uh, any uh, potential further destabilization of the Middle East. So um, I will leave it here and uh, obviously happy to answer any questions that might be made. Thank you. Thank you, Eldar, for giving the, um, the view from the EU. Maybe just a, a follow-up question from my side. You mentioned that the EU shouldn't see the Iran only through the lenses of the GCPOA. Is there any, any debate at the EU level regarding a future strategy on Iran that would tackle, for instance, its regional behavior, human rights, and other aspects? Well, uh... All those issues are obviously always on the table. And to my knowledge, the joint statement uh, by the uh, High Representative Federica Mogherini and then Foreign Minister of Iran, Javad Zarif, of April 2016 uh, uh, is still valid in the sense that it provides a broader, um, let's say, grounds for uh, bilateral relations. Uh, the aspects that you mentioned, the regional policies, uh, human rights issues, they obviously are on the agenda. The question is, uh, can we address them effectively without JCPA, without having a basis uh, for dialogue? As uh, former High Representative Mogherini used to say, uh, JCPA is a foundation, but not a ceiling uh, for bilateral relations. So I would say uh, return to the agreement is essential. Uh, and that would have a uh, beneficial effect also on those other issues that, I, that, that you mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Eldar. Now, now maybe just to move into the, the Q&A, we have a question from uh, Jerome Legrand. Uh, is there a role for Turkey in the context of new Taliban Afghanistan? Views from our experts are welcome. Uh, I'm not sure who would be best fit to address this. Maybe you, Mohammed, could... Uh, look at this i'm not sure if your best place to look at it but maybe you can offer a few thoughts from what i've seen from turkey is that so far they are increasing their engagement with pakistan most recently they had a joint trilateral military exercise in azerbaijan where you had turkish pakistani azerbaijani forces <clears throat> near the border which led iran to be quite sensitive about that as shirin has pointed out erdogan has been predatory in places like syria as well but having said that, I think Turkey right now is not wanting to directly engage in Afghanistan for a variety of reasons, including the lack of necessary, what they call, I think, security assurances from Taliban. So they refuse to operate the airport in Kabul, for instance. Beyond that, Turkey is allied to Qatar. And right now, the lead Arab power in Afghanistan, the lead kind of interlocutor for the Taliban with the outside world is Qatar. Everything goes through Doha, uh, which Turkey is allied with. So I think Turkey sees that it can exert influence indirectly. And right now, the risk of going in there directly uh, outweigh the potential cost. So I think it's being uh, watchful. And it's engaging increasingly with Pakistan, which, of course, is another major actor in Afghanistan. So I think it's being clever in that sense. It's being cautious, but it's also being proactive. So I hope this makes sense. Thank you. Moving on to a second question that we received. I'm sorry, could I add a word on the Turkey involvement in Afghanistan? Uh, I, will be very, I will be very brief. The only point I have to make in here uh, that uh, given the ethnic and sectarian um, uh, sort of fabric of Afghanistan, bringing Turkey in uh, would complicate matters much more. Uh, in addition to the Sunni Shia, Hazara, and whatever, you also you will add, add the Turk Tajik uh, thing, uh, um, to, to the mix. Uh, and, uh, and I also think that probably Russia might raise some eyebrows, um, but I'm not going to go too far. But in general, I think that already ta Turkey has overreached. I think that if we are in Europe also, you know, our obsession with Iran has led uh, both the United States and Europe to allow Turkey to do things like, for example, constantly bombing Iraq and going into another country's uh, uh, land or the things that they have been doing in regard to the Azerbaijan in Nagorno-Karabakh and being openly really asking and promoting, for example, 
ethnic separatism in Iranian Azerbaijan and other things. Uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, while we are obsessed with Iran, it's useful for Europe to reassess really the value of Turkey as an ally as well, because some of the problems they are causing, including in the Iraqi Kurdistan, and of course in Syria, the way they went in, uh, it's, um, you know, we have a binary view that everything Iran does is bad and everything Turkey does is somewhat good. So I think that you cannot discuss these things in isolation from one another. Thank you. Uh, now, before going on to another question in the q and I had myself another question, and maybe Azadeh is the best place to, to answer this. In light of the new um, of the negotiations to, to create a new German German government, are there any changes expected towards uh, Iran? Are there any, any shifts in, in policy? What, what do you think the future will bring in this sense? I think in the short term, um, there's likely going to be much more continuity than change. The Social Democrats who will be leading the new coalition were part of the previous government as well, and they were pretty great supporters of the, of the JCPA and tried to maintain it. Um, the Greens and the Liberals who will be part of the new coalition are certainly also um, aware of the importance of the JCPA in non-proliferation terms. We might see more emphasis, though, on human rights issues, particularly coming from the Greens. I think they have been much more vocal about the human rights um, situation in Iran. So I think the longer the nuclear crisis um, is, is going on and continues, the more challenging it might be for a new Germ German government internally to stick to this kind of compartmentalization that we saw so far that Shreen also mentioned, mentioned before. I think that's going to be challenging. Other than that, you can expect to see much closer, you know, a transatlantic cooperation. This is something that is particularly important also for the, for the liberals. Um, so I'm not that optimistic about more investment and strategic autonomy, to be honest. I saw that drive on the Trump. I don't see that drive that much anymore under the Biden administration. I see a strong drive to have a common transatlantic approach here. Um, and lastly, I think one challenge that might be on the horizon is, is you know, the, the presidential elections in France next April. I mean, we don't know the outcome yet. This might, depending on the outcome, um, have a huge impact on E3 dynamics, um, but that's too early to, too early to say. Thank you. Now, moving on a bit back to the, to the regional uh, interactions and uh, a question coming from John Palmer is, in what light should we view the recent uh, diplomatic rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia? I think maybe uh, you, Mohammed, could, uh, could look into this. Sure. I mean, we've uh, extensively covered this on uh, Anvaj Media, and uh, we, have, we had a report just last night that the uh, fifth round of negotiations between the two sides, which had been planned for early November, has been temporarily paused pending the formation of the next Iraqi government. So what's happened so far is that four rounds of talks have been held this year between Iranian and Saudi security officials. It's been focused primarily on Yemen, much, much less so on Lebanon. And the aim is to try to form understanding of each other's position and down the line normalize relations. So far, uh, Iran has sought steps such as the reopening of consulates, etc., but the Saudis want to put that towards the end of the process. We also reported last night that uh, MBS sent a message to Raisi, allegedly according to our sources, and this message contained a hint that were ties to be normalized, there will be a major economic component to it, that there will be trade and investment between the two sides. But obviously, any such initiative would rely not just on normalization of relations between Tehran and Riyadh, but it would also be dependent on the lifting of US extraterritorial sanctions, which means it's dependent on the JCPOA, right? So it all ties up together. But I think the most important dynamic to look at when you examine the Iran-Saudi engagement is that, why is it coming now? After all of these years under Trump of vehement and open hostility, what's happened, what's changed? And I think the shifts in the Iranian Emirati relationship um, in recent years, especially since May 2019, are very instructive. And I'll tell you exactly why. Uh, UAE was also vehemently opposed to the Islamic Republic under Trump. But then what happened was that in May 2019, suddenly four tankers blew up off the coast of Fujairah. And within the coming days, there's a major Emirati security delegation engaging with the Iranians and reportedly 
700 million dollars of Iranian assets were unfrozen. And what happened there was that I think the UAE realized that uh, the US security commitment is not as strong as they thought. And this is a bigger cross-partisan or bipartisan issue, I think. Whether you sit in Saudi or UAE right now, you understand that Iran is, uh, is becoming more assertive and the US commitment isn't there. The US wants to get out of the region. It wants to focus on the bigger issues and the bigger rival, which is China. There isn't really that much for the US and West Asia these days. So I think these kind of shift is not just impacting these countries' willingness to engage with Iran, but it's also leading to new alliances in the region. And I think it's in this context that you should look at things like, the, for instance, normalization of ties between UAE and Israel. Uh, so I hope this makes sense. Thank you. Now I'm, I'm also mindful of the time and I'll just maybe ask you to bear with me just a, a couple of more minutes. Uh, I know there are many more questions in the in the Q&A box. I think we can just go on for hours with this discussion, maybe, maybe just to end on a forward looking note. I would just ask maybe very briefly from, from each of you one thing that uh, you think it's important to follow in the, in the next month. The most important thing regarding the, the GCPOA, the Iran's foreign policy, all of the subjects that we um, we managed to, to cover today. And maybe I'll just start in reverse order as we began, and I'll go with, with Eldar first. Very briefly, I think the most important thing is to achieve a breakthrough in Vienna. And that hinges again on uh, United States offering some reasonable uh, mechanism, some reasonable reassurance that uh, what Trump did with uh, withdrawing and violating the agreement that that uh, will not happen again. Uh, Mohammed? Uh, echoing Eldor, I think JCPOA is key and speaking to a European audience now, I think Europe can play an important role if it steps up and operationalizes these instruments which are there but not being implemented, not being used by injection, by injecting Iranian assets into instincts, for instance to show that they can take action, they can provide at least some, some confidence building measures, some goodwill. Iran has requested the unfreezing of $10 billion worth of its assets from the US. I think maybe the Europe can play a role here in bridging that gap. As a day. Yes, I mean, Elda already made, I think, a perfect point. I can fully agree. Um, as I said before, obviously, I think Instex is an instrument that, that could uh, be more seriously taken into consideration and worked with from the European perspective here. And Europe still obviously has a role to play. I mean, without Europeans and the other parties, there wouldn't even be any communication between the US and Iran right now because there are no direct channels. So obviously, Europeans have an important role to play. They can step up their efforts to provide this kind of safety net that I think is important also in terms of assurances for Iran. And just to add to that, this is not something that just Iranian political elites demand. It's actually something that the Iranian population expects as well. They were promised uh, economic recovery in 2015, and we did not deliver on those promises. And the population has been suffering for it on top of all the sufferings that they already have to go through in the domestic environment. So this is, I think, a reasonable demand where we have to find more creative solutions and Europeans can play a significant role here. And, uh, and Shireen? Well, um, it seems I have the last word. Um, I would say that outside world cannot save Iran. Uh, there are certain things. I mean, the expectation that the United States, given the way I know the dynamics of politics in the United States, is going to do something dramatic that to enable uh, Ayatollah Khamenei and the motley of different groups that are operating in Iran uh, to be able to uh, get themselves out of this jam is absolutely, as we say in Washington, whistling Dixie. Um, the same thing, I think that no matter what Europe should or shouldn't do, the fact of the matter is that strategic independence is way, way far away for Europe. Uh, Europe cannot develop the kind of uh, 
uh, deterrent that the United States took United States almost 70 years to develop. So, and they are not willing to pay the price for that. So this is also one thing we have to remember. It's all very nice. You know, I have been hearing this in various incarnations almost for 50 years coming from Europe, from the French IDF to all this other stuff. So having said this, Iran's problems by and large are domestic. And I think it has to do with the fact that Iran is still caught in a perpetual revolution. You cannot pursue a revolution and then expect to have normal relations with other states, whether it is Afghanistan, whether it is this, whether it's that. So what you have, Iran is surrounded. Um, why Iran ended up in Afghanistan the way it is? First, it didn't understand the Pashtuns don't like Iranians. I have seen it, experienced it in Afghanistan personally. So Ashraf Ghani was even worse than Taliban for Iran, but they kept because they don't want to deal with America. So they accept everybody. They give concessions to Turkmenistan, to Afghanistan, to Erdogan, all and sundry. So Iran's problem is domestic. And fundamental is, as a colleague of mine many years ago, uh, you should ask him to talk. Farhad uh, Khosrokhavar, I don't know whether he, uh, he is alive or not. He said, uh, how to get out of the Islamic revolution? Comment sortir d'une révolution islamique? This is Iran's problems. Uh, Khatami, others tried to come out of this and they didn't. And my problem is that the lessons that the Iranian hardliners learned from Soviet Union is that reform is dangerous. So I think they are going to knuckle down. I think they're going to knuckle down. And I also have to say that I was one of the people who was skeptical and I have written this, that the expectation that Biden is going to be, uh, you know, all sweetness and light. Look at Biden's Secretary of State. Biden's Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, is what is known in Washington as liberal interventionist. He supported military intervention in Syria. And recently in an interview with, uh, I think it was CBS or ABC, um, he did not rule off the use of, I think we have to talk instead of talking to Americans or to the Europeans, people who have access to Iranians have to talk to the Iranians. Iran's other problem is that there is a widespread illiteracy about international relations. And they really don't know. They, under, they don't understand the power dynamics. You cannot ignore United States and hope to have, whether this is just or unjust, legal or illegal. There is, this is the problem. And they, they constantly say we sacrifice and jihad, we are gonna overcome economic, and how you are gonna produce money. So what I mean is that the Iran's well-wishers those who have some access to people should not allow them to really um, continue in this misperception and, and think that somebody is going to suddenly come out of nowhere and, and to save them. I'm sorry if I had a uh, sort of a pessimistic note, but I do believe that rather than going to the minutia of JCPOA and this and that, we have to look at the what I call the problematic of Iran. This has been a problematic as uh, Lord Kerzin wrote Persia and the Persian question. The problem is in the international relations, we no longer read history, theories, but no history. And uh, you know, those who ignore history, you know, past is prologue. So thank you again and uh, uh, good luck for your future program. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much to, to all of you for this uh, fruitful discussion. I, I certainly learned a lot uh, this afternoon, and I'm sure also our, our audience. And I'm looking forward to our future events on uh, on Iran, on the regional aspects, and also on the GCPOA. Once again, thank you very much, and have a nice evening.